but I want to, you know, go back to deterministic. What, why am I saying determinism? Many things that we, when we teach you dynamical systems are fraudulent, the claims that we make. So one peculiar thing about introductory books is that we pretend that we can specify the initial state to infinite precision, which we cannot. So the representative point is always finally uh, presented or what's called coarse grain. It's presented to some accuracy. Now that'll turn out to be profoundly important that uh, you cannot specify. The behavior of ideal system with infinite precision and infinitely precise law is deeply and profoundly different from finitely specified system. And that's the basic of statistical mechanics. You know, that's why we have statistical mechanics. Things like error of time, it happens because of that. But in the idealization which we'll use and, you know, it doesn't cause too much trouble, we, we'll, we'll accept that X, the state of the system representative thing, is actually a little cloud of points that we can make as small as we want, like 10 to the minus 14. We can make it a small fraction of a Fermi. Uh, you know, we can make it smaller than any quark. And what we'll discover in the systems we're interested in, no matter how small we make it, it'll grow on us exponentially this time. And turns out, as our co-citizens might have learned, they've learned the word exponential, you cannot beat exponential. So it doesn't matter <laughs> how precise the system is. Uh, the behavior of deterministic systems will be very different from idealized, infinitely specified, or finitely specified thing. So, but we'll pretend that law is precise, and so there's unique point, if you start with unique point, to another one. And determinism means is that if I follow one trajectory and somebody else comes and comes through the same point I've passed, so this is not a projection, it's identical point. In other words, uh, you know, when that person is that point, she's going to the left, but you're going to the right. That's forbidden. So determinism assumes that almost every place, except for set of measure zero, measure zero means whenever somebody says measure zero, you say, aha, uh -huh. on a, my ruler, the fractions of millimeters of inches, they're rational numbers. But I know that if I blow up any little thing under the microscope, I'll see many more Russian numbers in any of them. And I know that if I throw a dart at this unit line, probability that I'll hit a Russian number is zero. So they every place they're dense, but their measure is zero. So that's good enough for this course. Now, how can in determinism measure zero happen? Well, sometimes you have to bow you know, bounce between uh, walls of a billiard, and maybe billiard has a knife edge, arbitrarily sharp knife edge. Ideally, that can happen. So now what happens is if my trajectory wanders around and hits this point, actually, on this point, I don't know where to go. So I have to do something. But the probability of hitting this point of measure zero is zilch. Now you say, okay, I don't care about it. It turns out these guys are very crucial because they'll tell us the difference between the left edge and the right edge. And they'll be extremely important in organizing all possible outcomes. So sets of measure zero are small. Uh, for example, we'll find fixed points and periodic orbits, which are sets of measure zero in the world of all possible things, very important. They'll help us organize things. Just like when you have a ruler, 
having fractions of an inch or millimeter on the ruler helps you measure distances, even though no thing is exactly one inch or you know one centimeter that you measure in the same sense. It's a very helpful idealization. That's determinism. We know determinism is a lie because there are no deterministic systems in nature. You know, everything that you ever do is stochastic in the following sense. You cannot specify precisely. Your law is approximate because you have, you know, accounted for electromagnetism, but you have forgotten special relativity, uh, not uh, general relativity, or you have forgotten, you know, weak interactions on God knows what. You have forgotten that in Alpha Centauri, some star has moved and it's changed the gravitational field. So we know that at some level, everything we do is noisy. Uh, the Greek word for this is stochastic. And we know that the real world looks like this. We start with some cloud, we follow our law, and what happens is all along, people who do this for a living, they call this trajectory that our eye sees because, you know, to one firm, it looks like a line to us. They call it drift. They call it equations of motion. And what they care about is the shape of this thing. And in a leading order, that's called a covariance matrix. And then there are all kinds of things called kurtosis and God knows what, all kinds of things. And now, how does this connect to the course that we are teaching here? Well, it turns out if the noise is weak, so you know, I'm doing my double pendulum, but the acoustical vibrations are changing it on Fermi's, or I'm doing my gravitational detection. <laughs> and my big rod is oscillating and gravitational waves are changing it a little bit. So it turns out that, you know, this has a good deterministic center. And to account for stochastic behavior, it's often a very good approximation to use the drift law and then explain how the nonlinear effects work on the noise. Now, if you do honest work and do neuroscience, it'll be the same thing. You know, there's lots of, for good reasons, lots of noise, but uh, the idealization of determinism provides the backbone for what to do this. Then there is this thing that uh, we all know is not determinism. Just kind of an interesting thing because Schrodinger equation is very deterministic in the sense that, let's see, in the sense that its predictions are accurate to arbitrary precision. It's just that its prediction gives you some kind of probabilistic intuition, which is not how we think of determinism. But in quantum mechanics, you deal, here you deal with probabilities, you know, how likely am I to be close to this trajectory? Uh, in quantum mechanics, you uh, deal with probability amplitudes. And the way they teach you quantum mechanics, it looks totally different <laughs> from Newton. So you think two things have nothing to do. But there is a thing uh, that you know people understood at the very beginning. I mean, quantum mechanics is no good unless it agrees with classical mechanics in appropriate limit. That's called semi-classical limits. But there's much stronger statement, which also comes from beginning of quantum mechanics, which is that says that it's still true, even for quantum mechanical setting, to look at classical trajectory of, let's say, electron or some particle in some external potentials, just like that. Integrate this classical thing that is called WKB approximation. Wenzel Kramer's balloon, doesn't matter. Or Schrodinger had it in his paper. And it turns out that uh, there is much useful quantum mechanics you can do using what we will teach you in this course, even though it looks so different when it's being taught in a voodoo of quantum mechanics. It has classical underpinning and the things get transported like stochastic ones. 
So to understand how this semi-classical method works, it's really good to understand determinism first. Uh, understanding stochastic processes is helpful because everybody understands what noise is. You know, I have to add up squares of errors. So that works. that's called covariance matrix. Once you have these two things, you're ready for the second or third part of the book, which is semi-classical quantum mechanics, which we will not cover in this course, but that's the basic idea.